So you have to start with why should someone vote for you? Why are you running? Um, I'm running because given my life history, leaving home at 16, the fourth of eight kids, the only one to have ever even embarked to go to college, working, putting myself through San Antonio Community College, then a degree in nursing, and then finally medical school, and coming to Iowa to do my residency, that history should, if nothing else, emphasize to people that um, I really support people being able to achieve their potential. And I never quit. I never quit fighting. I never give up. Uh, that I, I find that uh, a small voice that is persistent can create change and can create dynamics. And I know that if I'm elected to Congress that I will be a huge advocate for Iowans. Uh, I'll continue to fight for the same things I did as a, a state senator, and that's access to affordable, portable health care that gives you choice. Uh, skills training and apprenticeships, trade schools that allow people uh, to uh, have a higher skill set, higher paying jobs and grow the economy. And, um, you know, reemphasizing that we need to have trust and accountability in our government institutions. And I really saw that when I was director of public health. And I think that's one of the things that we've lost. I've seen that now when people talk about the vaccine for COVID-19 that I will be the first one to sign up for. I know that the University of Iowa is, uh, is a center for that. And so I think that we need to come together, uh, re restore trust in our institutions, have government accountability, uh, and really work hard for the citizens of Iowa and our, for, for our great nation. You talk about restoring trust in our, in our facilities and in our, in our government. Let's talk about the COVID pandemic and the national response. It's been pretty much left state to state to state for a lot of what's going on as far as this pandemic is concerned. Do you think the federal government really has stepped away at a time when it should not have had? I think the federal government did uh, things that the federal government needs to do and that only they can do, like mobilizing uh, businesses and entities to produce ventilators, to produce uh, personal protective equipment, uh, our testing and our reagents. But we are a federalist system, and I think that we know, uh, even in your community, in our state, Iowa isn't the same as New York or New York City. And even in Iowa, you know, a tumble where I live isn't the same as necessarily Davenport or Iowa City or other areas. So I think the federalist system where there is some latitude, if you will, for what people actually see on the ground is helpful. But at the same point in time, yes, you know, nationally, what the federal government needs to do, closing borders, mobilizing uh, manufacturers to uh, change their product line and produce something different. And then seeing even our small businesses do that on their own. So for instance, Mississippi Brewing making, um, you know, uh, hand sanitizer or a company like MD Orthopedics or Frog Legs in my town making face shields uh, or making other personal protective equipment to see them step up to the plate. So I think there's this combined both national response and national strategy. And we're going to see that with the vaccine. There has to be a national strategy for how we disseminate and distribute the vaccine and to whom it goes to first. And then also a state response and then even a, a local response, but having also the support of the federal government for that. We've seen a lack of confidence among some politicians in the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the FDA and the way it is uh, responding to this pandemic. Do you think that's justified or, or do you think that is hurting the institutions more than it's helping? Well, I can understand part of it on people who you know, don't have the same knowledge level of others that are professionals in these areas. When you see changing guidelines, it makes you susceptible uh, to uh, uh, you know, lacking trust in those institutions. But I think what we've seen uh, of COVID-19, and it bears repeating, and I would like to see elected officials and health officials uh, repeat this, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, the virus, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, the disease, has been a very resilient virus and it has not responded in the way typical viruses respond. So the coronavirus that causes the common cold or influenza uh, that causes our seasonal influenza, influenza, they're seasonal, they go away, uh, they affect people, they, you know, they do mutate and so you have to have a different vaccination for influenza every year, but yet they still respond in a certain way. And SARS-CoV-2 has not done that. It has not proven to be seasonal, it has mutated, it has changed which organ systems, so again, remember when we started the uh, pandemic, primarily we thought it was respiratory. And then we found that uh, it was neurological, affecting smell and headaches, and even some people developing 
uh, and encephalitis or meningitis-like disease. Then it was gastrointestinal, and now there's uh, vascular or blood clotting abnormalities. So it's changed the organ systems, it's changed how it affects those, and then also how it affects the immune system. So it is proven to be a strange virus, uh, very weird, not typical for viruses, and as such, we've had to adapt and change our messages. So. I think um, one of the things I'm very uh, staunch advocate for is for transparency. So I think had the CDC and the FDA initially came out with masks can be helpful, uh, they're uh, more important to help protect other individuals, but we don't want to run on N95 masks that were needed for healthcare facilities. You know, uh, you can do these things in lieu of that as we ramp up production. I think those kind of things would have been very helpful to be very transparent in what the thought process was, what the necessity was, what the benefit was, and there'd be less uncertainty now as we, uh, as we come through this. Getting a vaccine rapidly doesn't mean the vaccine is not going to be ineffective and it's not going to be safe. It still has to go through all the same regulatory hurdles. It's just that some of them are doing, being done at the same time. And we also have some experience with SARS-CoV-2 because the University of Pittsburgh was already looking at the original SARS. So they had some information and data and experience with uh, dealing with this type of virus. So I think that should give uh, people some comfort and security uh, in that, number one, know that the virus is changing. So um, how we talk about the virus and recommendations may change also, uh, that we're, but for all of our institutions to be more transparent with their data, with their information, with the rationale and the thought process, I think would help all of us to be more secure and feel more comfort uh, that the information we're getting is both up to date, state of the art, and is reliable. Well, COVID-19 not only has a huge health impact, as you know, it has an economic impact as well. They've been struggling with coming up with another relief package, perhaps $1,200 per person. Also question of whether or not you should help out some local governments, even state governments. Where do you stand on both of those things as far as a relief package is concerned for individuals, as well as relief for government? Yeah, I think that the relief package that was um, originally passed was necessary, and I think another relief package uh, uh, is in order. And, you know, you've heard the refrain, this is life versus the economy. To me, this is life versus life. As a state senator, I had to help individuals to navigate through stimulus checks, unemployment. Um, I've had companies approach me um, that they were about to lose their business and how to help them to stay in business, how to help them navigate PPP. Um, I've uh, known farmers who have committed suicide when they had to euthanize their herds. Uh, we know that child abuse is up, but when kids aren't in school, the, uh, one of our biggest sources of mandatory reporters is, is not seeing children, uh, addiction, drug overdoses, uh, depression. And depression, chronic depression, can lead to long-term health problems and uh, a life expectancy that's much shorter. So this is life versus life. All of us are making sacrifices. All of us have suffered through this, whether we know someone that's had COVID-19 or who has died, you know, even if they have other pre-existing medical conditions have died with COVID-19. Uh, it is a serious illness. It has tremendous ramifications to us, both for our health and for the health of our economy. And, and a package that helps individuals, helps small businesses, I think is very important. How much help it gives to states, I, I think, you know, do you think we, here in Iowa, we in Iowa, we've had uh, a very um, uh, fiscally conservative budget. We saved money. We uh, put money back into our emergency funds. We have a state law that requires us to spend no more than 99% of our revenues. And because of that, we have uh, weathered the pandemic in a good fashion and the uh, subsequent uh, derecho uh, storm as well because we had those conservative um, fiscal uh, uh, policies. And so should we ask the taxpayers of Iowa, and an essential worker, someone who has to go to work every day, who may make, make minimum wage or, let, or you know, above minimum wage, to ha pay taxes to support and bail out a state such as Illinois or California or New York, who um, you know, have uh, you know, uh, very expansive spending packages. So I do struggle with that. Uh, there is some help, I think, that needs to go, but as far as the federal government dictating election laws, um, I'm not in support of that, and I am not for asking an essential worker, minimum wage worker in Iowa to pay taxes to bail out states who have a spending problem and who have a longstanding spending problem, not just because of the pandemic. What about to bail out farmers? We're seeing uh, uh, farm bankruptcies on the rise right now. Um, markets were closed during uh, trade discussions. Um, a, a huge bailout already occurred and farmers are still struggling. 
Yeah, farmers are struggling, as uh, have uh, some manufacturers, as has individuals in the hospitality sector, such as, uh, you know, uh, our restaurant, our airline, our uh, hotel motel. Uh, and that also serves as a, as a source for tax revenue for cities and states. And so I think one of the things the president has said very well is that businesses were closed down and have, you know, can be close to bankruptcy, not because they themselves had a poor business model, but because we imposed a shutdown on them to try to save as many people as possible. Uh, and until we learn more about the virus to learn how to keep people safe while we safely and soundly reopen our economy. So I think it was appropriate. Uh, farmers have been especially hit because we had the tariffs as we navigate through uh, a phase, uh, phase one trade agreement with China. Uh, and we're uh, going through that process and I think it will accelerate after the election. Uh, and then, of course, their markets were closed uh, with the pandemic. And if you were a livestock producer, uh, uh, processing plants were closed. And, and that's where I said I've known of, of farmers who have committed suicide because they had to euthanize their herds. So I think that was appropriate. But one of the things that farmers have told me repeatedly is that when it came to the tariffs and the trade agreements, that they felt that that was short-term pain for long-term gain. For uh, over a decade, they've told me something needed to be done about China and its egregious trade practices. So how we hold China or the Chinese Communist Party accountable uh, for COVID-19, I think you do that through um, international organizations with uh, international partners. Both sides, political campaigns. Um, you say your Democratic opponent is too linked to the Democratic Party. You, of course, have a Republican. Where would you diverge to represent Eastern Iowa, perhaps at the expense of supporting Republican policy? Well. Um, in the state Senate, I was the chair of human services. And uh, so as the chair, I put forth bills. Didn't matter if they were Republican bills, Democrat bills, but if they ma made good health policy sense, I put them forward. And, and sometimes in doing that, you actually bring your party along with you. And so uh, we passed a bill uh, to have oral contraceptives for over age 18, uh, over the counter or behind the counter. Uh, I passed legislation to get uh, a waiver from the five-year eligibility waiting period for lawful permanent residents who are pregnant to get access to prenatal care. We passed bills on non-medical switching of your prescription medications. And what that means is it uh, to prevent the insurance company from switching your prescription medication to a, a lower priced or cheaper prescription medication just on the basis of the cost without that change being initiated by your physician or your provider. Uh, so passing legislation such as that, uh, they weren't necessarily Republican ideas. They weren't, some of them were Democrat ideas, some Republican ideas, some, uh, you know, no one knew about, but we passed them in and put them forward. And to be able to bring people to consensus, to compromise, and remember that you're there to serve. I've been able to do that through my time as both a nurse, as a physician, as a director of public health, and even in the military in the 24 years I uh, spent in the military. And I think if you remember to treat people with respect and dignity, so I follow the golden rule, it sounds kind of kindergarten-ish, but if you treat people with respect and, dignity, uh, and dignity, uh, you interact with them, remembering uh, I don't question people's motivations, um, that uh, if uh, we're there to serve, we're there to do what's best for Iowans. And if we remember that, and that's our guiding principle, then I think that we're going to be guided to do things in the proper and the right way, and we'll keep fighting for Iowans and then for our great country.